Good morning to all of you. It's always a joy to come and worship the Lord with you. And uh, I want to thank those of you who have been faithful in this house. Amen? Because you know this is where the Lord has planted you. This morning, I have a simple assignment I want to do. I'm going to talk to you about the whole Bible in 30 minutes. The whole Bible. What the whole Bible is about. And so, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful to you as we open the word. May you speak to each one of us through the reading of your word. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My topic is why I was created by God. Why I was created by God. We're going to read a lot of scriptures this morning. The first scripture is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I want you to know before I formed you in the womb, you know, there are a lot of people who don't believe that they were created by God. But one of the things you need to understand, even though it was the union between your mother and father, the formation of a baby the formation of a human being is the work of God. That is why up to this time, scientists could, they can produce a human being outside the womb. It's not possible. You can do it because it's the work of God. So God said, I formed you. So everyone here, I want you to understand that. Because sometimes young people will come up and say, look, I don't know God. God didn't create me. I came into this world because my mother and my father came together and that is how I was produced. But God is telling us that he formed you in the womb. It's a work of God. It's a mystery. You cannot fully understand how that takes place. Are you hearing me? Okay. So God formed all of us. So your, your makeup Everything is God. In Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. I formed for you were for you formed my inward parts. This is David speaking. For you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. David is saying that you form me in my inward parts. So you put me together. Whilst I was in my mother's womb, you put me together. And that is the reason why you need to come to a point to accept yourself. You know, the problem with all of us is that we don't want to accept the way God has made us. So somebody wants to become like this person. Somebody also wants to become like that person. God made you accept your form. Some people who are short say, I don't want to be short. I want to be tall. People who are tall say, I don't want to be tall. I want to be short. You know, uh, the... A black man says, I don't like my skin. He wants to bleach his skin. The white man says, I don't like my skin. He wants to tan his skin. And he goes to the sun and lie in the sun. And, you know, all kinds of things. And today, uh, you know, plastic surgery is the, is the most, uh, you know, thing that you can get money from because women don't like their, you look as I don't like my nose. And so he wants to go and then make my nose like this. Somebody say, I don't like this. And if, no, you need to come. You see, you will never like anything about yourself because you did not make yourself. 
And if God were to give you the choice, you would have been ugly. <laughs> I'm telling you, because sometimes we go for things we don't want, but that is what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. So everybody learn to accept yourself. God shaped you. He formed you and accept it that I was made by God. I like my form. I look into the mirror. I look at myself. I say, Ransford, you are short, but you are handsome. <laughs> Amen. Yes, you need to accept yourself. Because that is the way God made you. It, it doesn't matter what you, you can add to it or you don't have to subtract. So David said, you formed my inward part and you covered me in my mother's womb. So every one of us must accept the fact that God made us. So why did God make all of us? Number one, God created me to know him. That is the first thing. God created you so that you will get to know him. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 23 and 24. Jeremiah 29, 23 and 24. The law says, from the Good News Translation I read, The law says, The wise should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. If anyone want to boast, they should boast that they know me and understand me because my love is constant and I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me. I, the Lord, have spoken. You know, many times we brag about the wrong things. We boast about the wrong things. And Jeremiah is saying that if there is anything you want to boast or you want to brag about is the fact that you know God. Because all of us are on a journey. And our final destination is heaven. And when you know God, that is where you are going towards. If you don't know God, it doesn't matter what you boast about. It will take you to the wrong place. You know, I've been to funerals upon funerals. And uh, there's nobody that I've asked that if you die, where do you want to go? Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everywhere I've gone. I mean, every I've done funerals upon funerals. and every, Everybody wants to die. He wants to go to heaven. Because God has put heaven in our hearts. And that's where we want to go to. And, and Jeremiah is saying that the things we boast about will not take you to heaven. What will take you to heaven is knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so he says that if anybody want to boast, boast for the fact that you know God. Amen? Yeah. We boast on the wrong things. Uh, do you know the school that I attended? Do you know the kind of uh, uh, designer shoe I wear? Do you know the kind of designer shirt I do this? It doesn't matter. It will not take you to any place. Amen? Amen. So he says that the best, the thing you need to talk about is the fact that you know God. Because God made you to know him. That is the first thing. Uh, the other scripture I have is Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10 and 11. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11 from the New Living Translation. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. But you are my witnesses, O Israel. See of the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me. Believe in me and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There is never has been and there will never be. I, yes, I am the Lord and there is no other savior. Isaiah is saying that the reason God chose the Israelites is for one thing, that they will know him. He said, you have been chosen to know me and believe in me and understand me. If you don't know somebody, how can you believe in him? So he made us so that you will come to know him. 
Amen. And so the Lord was through the prophet Isaiah was telling the Israelites, the reason why I chose you is that I want you to know me and to believe in me. And once you believe in me and you start walking with me, you begin to understand me. Amen. So God wants every one of us to know him. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. From the contemporary English version. Let us do our best to know the Lord. His coming is as certain as the morning sun. He will refresh us like a rain renewing the earth in the springtime. Hosea is saying is that, let us pursue, let us continue, because knowing God is not one-time experience, it's a lifetime experience. Knowing God is a lifetime experience, because he's a great and a big God. You cannot just know him one day, it's a lifetime experience. That is why Paul said, that I may know him. He knew God already. He met God at the road of Damascus. That is the encounter he had with God. But he's saying that, that I may know him and know the power of resurrection because it's a lifetime experience. You get to know more about God because the more you get to know him, the more you can believe him, the more you can understand him. Amen? It's very, very important. You see, uh, when I was young, the way I knew God, and at this age, the way I know God is a vast difference. Because you get to understand and get to know and get to know. And once you know, you understand him. Let me give you a typical example. A child is walking with his father. And he sees the airplane. And he says, Father, Daddy, I want you to buy me an airplane. And the daddy say, yes. The child is about six or eight years. So his understanding about the father is limited. He thinks the father is a millionaire. When he gets to the age of 22, he's not going to blame the father and say, you disappointed me. You said you buy me an airplane. Because at the age of 22, he will understand that the father cannot buy even one tie of an airplane. <laughs> so, so he will not, because his understanding has improved. It's the same way as you get to know God and you get to walk with God. Gradually, your understanding about God improves and you understand him better and you trust him well. Are you hearing me? If you don't know God, you see your level of knowledge of God is like a child or like this way, then you get mad at God when something happens. Because there are some people, all that they know God, they know God as a Father Christmas. And uh, uh, they know God as a God who doesn't even, you know, don't care. So all that, he shower you with good things, good things, good things. That's all. That's what they know God. You get to come up a little bit and you get to know that it's not only a God who only shower good things, but he also wants your good. And so he will sometimes tell you that I won't give you this because it's not good for you because he knows what is best for us. He created us and he knows what is best for us. What may be good for me may not be good for you. What may be good for you may not be good for me. And that is why we need to trust him and get to know him. So he created you you so that you can know him and the question I ask you what level of knowledge do you have about God where is your experience with God where is your experience with God the more you get to trust him that is what he is he will reveal himself to you gradually it's a gradual process amen in John chapter 17 this is the prayer of Jesus John chapter 17 Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So we tell people to know God, start with Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the God who created the heavens and the earth. 
It's very, very important. Are you hearing me? It's very important. You know, uh, we had a, a function in uh, Ghana. The king of Ashanti was doing a project. And then when you live in Kumasi, when the king calls you, you can't say no. He's the most powerful king in, in, in Ghana and even in West Africa. So he had a function and then I was called to do the opening prayer. I was privileged to do that. When the king asked you to come and open something, it means you are privileged. So I went and then I prayed. Then at the closing, they asked a Muslim to come and do the closing prayer because it's a national affair. So they want to involve everybody. When the Muslim man came, he spoke to us in a language all of us can understand. And then he said, I'm going to pray. But when he started praying, he started praying in Arabic. Then I asked myself, why didn't he pray in the language that we all understand that he stood and talked to us about? Then it occurred to me, the Muslim God understand Arabic. He doesn't understand any other language. It's like when you go to my village, there's a shrine there. The priest of that shrine speak to that God in the local language. He can't speak to that God in English because that God doesn't understand English. Are you hearing me? But the God we serve understand every language and so everybody can talk to God in any language because he created the languages so he's not limited by one language yeah. are you hearing me so that's why when we come in and we are worshiping God everybody can worship him in whatever language you want because he understands everything if you don't know Jesus you don't know the God who created the heavens and the earth to know that God you must give your life to Jesus it begins with that amen, amen. and so I pray that the Lord will help us number one God created you to know him amen and it's a lifetime experience. All of us have different, different ideas about God. Don't worry. You keep trusting him. And you keep walking with him. You know, when I gave my life to Christ, there were a lot of questions I had. But nobody answers those questions for me because as I start walking with God, reading the Bible, praying, and fellowshipping with God, he answers those questions because the Holy Spirit is a great teacher. He will help you. And so if you are here and you have questions about God, I say you just continue to trust him, believe him, do what he's asking you to do, and he will help you to know him. And the more you get to know him, the more you don't want to go away. Amen. You will grab him and you say, Lord, I want you. So God made you that you can know him. Number two, God created me. One, God created you to know him. Number two, God created me to love him. And that is worship. Number one, he created you to know him. That is salvation. Number two, he created you to love him. That is worship. God, because you can't love somebody you don't know. That's why it's because you see, the more you get to know that person, the more you get to love the person. Are you hearing me? You know, when you marry the first time, you know the person, but you don't know uh, the person better. But as you get to live with that person and you see the nature of that person and you see that this person is caring and this person is loving, then you get to love him more. But when you marry the person, you realize that, oh, all the things that he said is not true. It's the other way. Then instead of love, it turns into hatred. Because you realize that you made a wrong uh, uh, mistake. You made a wrong judgment. When you get to know God, you see, and the more you walk with him, the love for him increases because you realize that he's a good God. Amen. And that is why he created you to know him. And once you get to know him, uh, you will spontaneously begin to love him. And that is what we call worship. Amen. And that's why we are here this morning. 
Because we want to love him, we want to love him more. People who don't understand, don't think that you have nothing to do in the morning and you come and sit here and everything. Because they don't understand, they don't know God. But once you get to know him, you realize that there is nothing that is more important than what we are doing this morning, is to love our God. Amen? So God created us to know him and to love him. Uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 38. Matthew 22, 36 and 38. Teacher, he asks, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the most important commandment. So God made you to love him. One, he made you to know him. Number two, he made you to do what? To love him. Then number three, God made you to serve him. God created me to serve him. And that is ministry. He made me to know him. That is salvation. He made me to love him. That is worship. Oh, then number three, he made me to serve him. God created me to serve him. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, from the contemporary English version, it says, people of Israel, what does the Lord your God wants from you? The Lord wants you to respect and follow him, to love and serve him with all your heart and soul. To love and serve him with all your heart and what? Soul. Then 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10 from the contemporary English version. It says, each of you has been blessed with one of God's many wonderful gifts. Each of you, every one of us, and I'm going to explain to you. To be used in the service of others, so use it, use your gift well. I've told you God created me to know him, one. And if I know him, I will love him. Amen? Amen? If you don't love him because you don't know him, are you hearing me? Then if you get to know the God I'm talking about, you will automatically love him. And then when you love him, the next thing that follows is that he said, I have gifted you so that you can use those gifts I've given you to serve me. Somebody will say, Pastor, what are the gifts God has given me? I'm going to explain to you so that you know. Because right now, if I come and I say, do you have any spiritual gift? You tell me you don't have any spiritual gift. But I'm going to explain to you so that you know what God has given you so that you can serve him with it. Number one, the first thing that God gave you is what we call talent. You were born with it. I've already told you that God said, I formed you. When he was speaking to Jeremiah, he said, I, I, I formed you in your mother's womb and I wanted you to be a prophet. So if a prophet should have a certain type of voice, he was made with that voice. If, 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 at that time, how they would perceive somebody to be a prophet, that is the same way God shaped him so that he will, he will be recognized as a prophet. So every one of us, when God was forming you, he gave you a gift, what you call talent. You were born with it. When you give your life to Christ, Christ wants you to use those talents to serve him. But if you don't give your life to Christ, Satan will use that talent also to expand his cause. And everyone here, there is nobody that can tell me I'm not good at something. Everybody is good at something. I tell people, there's nobody in this world who is all bad. And there's nobody who is all good. We are part good and bad. True or false. Some 75% good, some 25 bad. <laughs> we are all part. Of, the person who is all good is Jesus Christ. 
And Satan is all bad. There's nothing good about him. <laughs> He's all bad. <laughs> you know, so God said, when I made you, I gave you gift, which you call talent. I want you to use that to serve me. Then number two. Remember the Bible say every good gift come from where? So whatever you have, if it's not good, then it's not coming from God. It's as simple as that. If it's good, it's coming from where? God. So God has given you talent. Number two, God also has, has helped you to acquire skills. There are skills that you have acquired. God helped you to acquire that skill. And so what you are supposed to use is to use that profession, that skill that God has given you to serve the Lord. Let me give you a typical example. Our church is big. It sits on 10 acres of land. Um, we have three services every Sunday morning. We have over 6,000 people coming to church. Our first service, you know when the, it starts? 6 o'clock in the morning. And the good news is that the most punctual people are the 6 o'clock. No, the thing uh, wrote, you know, the 6 o'clock are the punctual people. Then you come to the 8 o'clock. The 10 o'clock are the habitual late comers. <laughs> so ask somebody, are you part of those that who come to church late? <laughs> you know, and uh, we use uh, buses. So we have the church, we have over 15 buses that the church owes. But on Sunday also, we rent some buses to be added. So these 15 buses, what happened is that all the professional drivers in the church, I said, that is what God has given you to serve the church. So they come as early as five o'clock, pack their car, and then take the bus. And then they go to town and bring people to church. What are they doing? They are using their profession, their skill to serve Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me? Uh, we have women who come early in the morning, as early as four o'clock. And they said, Pastor, uh, we know how to sweep. So they come to the church and then sweep and dust every place and clean every place and prepare it for the service. What are they doing? They are using their skill, what they know to serve Jesus Christ. Then we have the third one is spiritual gifts. Spiritual gift is for only Christians. When you become a Christian, God gives you a spiritual gift. So everybody sitting here, you have three gifts. So don't tell me you don't have any gift. Don't say that. It's an insult to God. Are you hearing me? It's an insult to God. God has talented you. He's giving you talent, something that you are good. Young people, you are very good in the computer setup. You, most of you are good. You know, let me tell you, I have people in our church professors and they are my research group if i'm going to preach on them on a message i tell them god made you a professor so that you can do the research for me so i have the group i tell them and then they make the research and everything and give me ideas and they will lecture me on it and then when i get there and i'm speaking the people look at me and they say oh pastor is very intelligent <laughs> <laughs> and they sit down, they are happy that pastor is using our research and they are happy. Are you hearing me? They are using what they have to serve Jesus. So wherever you are, whatever, there are so much that God has blessed you with. You. Don't sit down in the church idol. God created you to serve him. Amen. Amen. He created you to know him. He created you to love him, and then he created you to do what? To serve him. And that is what we call ministry. And the last one, he created you to talk about him. And that is what we call missions. He created you to talk about him. You see, every one of us, you have two legs. One leg is in the church, and that is service. Everything you do in the church is service. Then you have a mission. Your mission is outside. So don't confuse the two. 
You know, many times people confuse the two because they do something in the church and they think that is all. No, You're, whatever you do in the church is a ministry. Outside that, you have a mission outside. Your mission outside is to talk about Jesus. And so God wants us to serve him with our talent and our gift. And as we go out, we also talk to people about Jesus. A lot of people don't know Jesus. But if you take your experience, your testimony, testimonies are so powerful. You know, when God was sending Moses... Moses said, if I go and I tell the people, how would they believe that you have sent me? First of all, he said, cast down your rod. And the rod became a snake and all those happened. And then he said, if they don't believe, what should I do? Then he said, put your arms on your armpit. And Moses did that and he became leprosy. And God said, put it back and then it was healed. In the Bible, leprosy is a type of sin. What he's saying is that if they will not believe you for the miracles that you did, your testimony, your own life, they know who you were, that they will believe. So if people will not believe signs and wonders, they know who you are. They know what happened to you and everything. They can't deny it. It's like Paul, when he stood before them and he was telling his testimony, King Agrippa said, Paul, much learning has made you mad. He said, not so, but I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. They couldn't deny what has happened to Paul. That's why Paul was so dangerous. In, at that time, in fact, you go to Israel, they don't hate so much Jesus. The person they hate is Paul because they said he came to spoil their religion. Because nobody could deny that because somebody, a persecutor, somebody that was going around and killing people. And all of a sudden, he said, I've met a man called Jesus and I've given my life to Jesus. And now he started loving him and talking about him. You can't deny it. It's a fact. You know, so your own testimony is very, very powerful. And that is why God says that I've saved you. I've come. You've known me. Yes, you love me. Great. You are serving me. Great. But I want you to go out and tell people about me, about my testimony. Amen. Tell people how you know me. It's very, very important. The scripture I read and then I close is... Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 27. This is Paul. Acts 20, 22 to 27. And now in obedience to the Holy Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit has warned me that prisons and troubles wait for me. 24. But I reckon my own life to be worth nothing to me. I only want to complete my mission and finish the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to do, which is to declare the good news about the grace of God. This is what Paul says. He says, all that I have a tax, my tax is that my mission is to talk about Jesus. And that is why he has saved you. To talk about him. And so I pray that every one of us. Get something doing in the church. That's the way we serve Jesus. Then apart from that. You go outside at the marketplace. You are there. Talk to people about what Christ has done in your life. Your personal testimony. They won't deny it. They know it. And they cannot deny that. I pray that the Lord will help us, that we will live for the reason why he created us. He created you to know him. And knowing him is a life experience. You get to know him more. And the more you get to know him, the more you get to love him. You see that there's nobody that loves you so much that, than him. And you fall in love with him all the time. You fall in love with him all the time. It comes by daily walk with him. 
And that is where when you get to, you can say with Paul, what can separate me from the love of God? Because you have come to know him and you realize that there is nobody that can offer you anything in this world apart from God. And so he said, nothing will be able to separate me from the love of God. So you love him more and love him more and love him more. Then when you love him, you realize that, look, he has blessed me with talents, with gifts, spiritual gifts, with all kinds of profession, with all kinds of skills he has given to me. I want to use it to serve Jesus. I want to use it to serve the church. We have different ministries in, in our church, different, different ministries. I mean, because everyone that is gifted, you know, uh, our buildings that we built, we have uh, all the architects that uh, they, they have a ministry. So I go to them and I say, this is what I want to do. And then they put it on paper and come and show me. I said, no, that is not exactly what I want. And this is what I want. This is what I want. And they do it. And then we get a contractor and they supervise and make sure that the person will do the right thing and everything. And they do it free of charge because freely you have received. Yes, and, and they're happy. And when they see the construction work, everything going up there, they are so happy that, look, I was able to use my profession at least to serve the church. Amen? And people go everywhere talking about Jesus. And you talk about Jesus all the time. Everywhere I go, I talk about Jesus. Not, you talk about Jesus not only even by mouth, but even by your life. Are you hearing me? I remember one day I was traveling and I was tired. And I, 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 want, I wanted to have a good sleep when I sit in the plane. When I sat there, the next person that came to sit beside me, because I always want the front side, you know, that you can have enough leg room and everything, you know, especially, you know, uh, if you travel economy, you want the, 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 the yeah. So you want the front side, so that is good. Then a lady with a baby came. I said, boy, I'm in trouble today. You know, I'd wanted to change my seat, but the flight was full. <laughs> so what can I do? So I said, okay. So I decided, I realized that I can sleep. So I decided to help the lady. So I'll help the lady, and if she needs something, I'll give it to her. If she want to go to the bathroom, I'll take care of the baby. And I, I took care. I was so nice and everything. And then, but I never told the lady that I'm a pastor. No, when I, when, when I go out, I don't tell people I'm a pastor. I behave like a Christian. Hello? I, are you hearing me? Uh, that's why I don't wear clerical, you know. Yes. <laughs> I behave like a Christian. So I was so nice. So when we got to, uh, uh, we landed and then we went to where to take our luggage. And then somebody who knew me, I was standing by, beside the lady. And I said, oh, pastor, pastor. Then the lady said, oh, are you a pastor? I said, yes. So, oh, where? I said, Kumasi. And then it's, where, where's your church? Then I mentioned, I said, CCC. He said, I live in Kumasi. I live in that area. Oh, that church. And because I was so nice to that lady, she started coming to church, gave her life to the Lord. And today he is one of the greatest givers in the church. Just helping her. I never spoke, but just being nice to the people. You know, when you're a Christian, it doesn't mean you are supposed to be mean. Be nice to people. Are you hearing me? Yeah, be nice to people. Sometimes there are some people, you see, there are some people, God will put you to, to, to some people who are not likable. You know, there are some people, when you meet them, you just like them. There are some, you meet them, they've not done anything, but you don't like them. <laughs> are you hearing me? Yeah, and God says, I want to teach you more love. I want you to go and extend with your love because greater love has no man than this, that a man who laid down his life for his friend. After people have forsaken him and everything, Peter denied him three times. And when you woke up, the first person after resurrection, he told Mary that go and tell Peter. He mentioned his name. This is the kind of Jesus we are following. Amen. 
He said, when they strike here, give this side to. If you can't, keep quiet and go. <laughs> if you can't, keep quiet and go. This is the person we are following. So the more you get to know him, the more you want to talk about him, you love him and everything. And God wants all of us. And this morning, I am asking you, make sure you have something doing in the church. You know, in a church like this, sometimes you think that they don't need help. They don't need volunteers. You think that every no is a lie. It's a lie. So I'm believing God that after this service, you will call up as a Garvin and say, Garvin, uh, this is my profession. This is the skills that I have. This is my talent. And I'm ready to work. Amen. Amen. I'm ready to do something for Jesus. Amen. And then now when you go out at your marketplace, at your work site and everything, God will bring the opportunity. You always pray, Lord, give me opportunity. Anytime I go to any place, that is the prayer I pray. Lord, give me opportunity to this. One of the things I find out is that Ghanaians like prayer. And so when uh, sometimes I go to the restaurant and then I'll be there. And then you realize that somebody, the, the, the attendants will come and then they will bring candles and they say, happy birthday to you. Then when I look, so I go. After they finish, I said, who is the happy uh, birthday lady or boy here and everything? Then there I introduce myself because every, every human being like prayer. Every, I'm telling you, every human being, it doesn't matter, even here, they like blessing. So I introduced myself. I said, I'm, I'm Pastor Ransford. Uh, I realize that you are celebrating your birthday. Would you mind if I ask God's blessing upon your life? Also, yes, I, I want it. And then I will pray for them and ask God's blessing upon their life and say, Lord, bless them. And that connection comes. And so sometimes I always carry cars with me. I said, this is it. Anytime you need me, you can call me in our church and everything. I use that. Just bless the pe people, you know. There's nobody who doesn't want prayer. Everybody. It's only a few people who will tell you, I don't want prayer. Everybody wants God's blessings. Even when they are drinking beer and they are drinking and they are, you know, whiskey, you say, do you want God's blessing? Oh, yeah, I want God's blessing. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody, so so in Ghana, in uh, our thirty first watch night here, we in Ghana thirty first watch night is a great night. Everybody, that is thirty first December, before we enter into New Year, everybody want God's blessing for the New Year. So what we do is that our thirty first watch night is evangelistic service. Sometimes we attract as much as 15,000, 20,000. So we do it outside. You would do it. It's like a crusade. And we get good musicians because sinners like music. <laughs> <laughs> so we get good musicians and they come and they sing and everything. And then I wait by 11 o'clock. Then all those people from the pop and everything, they've all come in. They want God's blessing. So I stand there and then I preach a short message because they don't like long messages. That's, you, you must understand sin. So I preach. <laughs> I preach a short message and then I make the altar call. I say, before we enter into the next year, I want you to go with God's blessing. But God's blessing comes through Jesus Christ. And so if you have Jesus, then you have his blessing. If you don't have Jesus, you can't have his blessing because the package is giving you is wrapped up with Jesus. So get Jesus and you get a package. And then people come and they give their life to the Lord. Everything, see, anything you can do to get people saved, get them saved. Because people need Jesus. And that is what, this, the rest of my life, I said, anything I can do to get people to say, and I'm using my influence now, because in Kumasi, where we live, we are a population of 2.5 million people. I've been in Kumasi since 1979, and because our church is the largest church, uh, people know me, and so everybody will love for Pastor Ransford to come and pray for them. So I, I, I pray for people everywhere, in the streets, everywhere. I want to bless them. And then... 
Now I tell people, if you have a funeral, come and I want to go and do the funeral because everybody at funeral, everybody is quiet. People you can never get in church and you can never get them listening to you. They come to funerals. I said, the only condition is that if you allow me to preach, then I'm going to conduct that funeral. And they want, you know, so, so I do that all the time because any opportunity, anything I can do to get people saved, we need to do that because people need Jesus and you know him and he wants to use you to talk about him I pray that the Lord may the Lord help us so that we will live to do what he has created us to do and let the church say Amen Father we, be, we are so grateful to you we want to thank you that you made us to know you and to know you is life indeed. And Father, I pray that even in our pursuit to know more about you, if there's anyone here in doubt about you, you, are, you have a way of explaining yourself. You, you are the great teacher. I pray that may the Holy Spirit begin to convict that person and help that person answer some of the questions the person may have in his mind. Lord, we pray that as we continue to love you, give us the grace to love you more all our life. And Lord, help us that we can serve you with what you have given us. And Lord, give us the courage as we go out into the world, not to be timid, but to talk about you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And let everybody say, Amen.